Welcome to the College of Knowledge. This time, the human future of work. A former mobile thought leader at Google, he now advises global brands on how to digitally transform their organizations and business models. Here is Stephen Griffith. What a welcome. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today about the value of human capital, which is the value of us, you know, ind individuals we bring, as teams we bring, and as organizations we bring. And I want to give a, a bit of a nuanced debate to the kind of polarizing one the press normally gives us around humans versus machines. And so when we looked at what leaders think are the mega trends that are going to be landing around 2030 that will affect our businesses affect changing word patterns. This is what they said. Environmental crises, globalization, changing demographics. So lower birth rates, increasing life expectancies, bigger pressures on local economies. But also the technology trends. So digital divergence, technological convergence. But what strikes me when I look at these mega trends is they're affecting us now, in 2017. We don't have to wait to 2030 to see what the effects will be. So it's time we sort of engaged with the things that are affecting us now and embraced it. So if we come more of a micro level and how, as consumers, we look at digital in our day-to-day -day lives. You know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, we welcomed in desktop computing, the web, and e-commerce. That transitioned to mobile computing and smartphones. And how smartphones became the core of our existence in terms of we always have our phones on, we're always connected, we're always engaged in socially with people within our networks. And they give you phenomenal convenience in terms of making transactions, in buying and booking things. They've got these incredible array of sensors in handsets now that give you location, location proximity, always on connectivity. You can touch to pay, touch to sign in, facial recognition. They're incredible supercomputers that we carry around in our day-to-day -day lives. But that's going one step further. And the next step is artificial intelligence. Now, the difference between AI and desktop and mobile computing is that AI isn't something that you touch and feel or see. It's an input to those existing services we already use on those devices. So it helps improve the things we already consume in terms of giving us more accurate information or being more proactive. It can anticipate our needs instead of reacting to what we've asked for. And that's the next step. Go from desktop to mobile to AI. So back to the press and the, the binary debate they keep uh, promising, which is humans versus machines. It's always a binary argument, and they always talk about the extremes. Whereas on the one hand, it's about humans and about our supremacy over machines, and technology doesn't have that much opportunity. We can continue to develop products and services, make lots of money. Life is great. Technology doesn't really affect us. On the other hand, there's the fear and uncertainty about AI and robots getting out of hand, about how advanced they've become, far too clever, threatening our roles. And my relative performance in work suffers by comparison because they're so consistent and they're so accurate. And they reduce me to manual labor. That's my future. So it's the fear and uncertainty and doubt caused by a lot of the press stories that basically promote this binary narrative. And it's not really helpful. So let's first of all look at a fantastic technological advance using artificial intelligence. So AlphaGo was a program developed a few years ago by a British company called DeepMind. And their goal was to develop a program that beat the world champion in a Chinese ancient board game called Go. Now, Go was always foreseen as impossible for a machine to beat a human because it's a game on strategy. And it's infinitely complex, because it has an infinite number of potential moves. But two years ago, they managed to develop an algorithm which defeated the World Go champion. And a few weeks ago, they launched AlphaGo Zero, which is the next version of AlphaGo. Now, AlphaGo was developed using a type of AI called machine learning. And that's where you have an algorithm that learns through supervised training on a big data set of previous games. So it learns how, did games, how were games won or lost, and if I made this move, am I more likely to win or lose? So you train it on a large data set, and over time, it then starts to train itself. 
AlphaGo Zero didn't need any data set to train on. It learned from scratch. After three hours of playing itself, it played like a human beginner. It didn't have any strategy, and it was just trying to take pieces as quickly as it could. After 17 hours, it started to develop a strategy for win or lose, or for territory. And after 70 hours, it played at superhuman levels. And it played against the previous version of AlphaGo and defeated it 100 to 0. Now, this is an incredible advance. It didn't need to be trained in supervised way on a data set. And it consumed an, uh, a fraction of the compute resources to become that, that advanced. The issue here is that it's constrained to the game of Go. You, you can't play a game of chess because the rules change. It can't help you meet your sales targets because the rules aren't necessarily the same. It can't be applied to curing a form of cancer because the rules haven't even been known and discovered yet. So AlphaGo is constrained to the game of Go. And that's what we see with a lot of artificial intelligence. Every problem it's trying to solve, it's a discrete use case, and we can't apply it to other areas. And AI isn't one thing. It's a mix of tools, a mix of practices, and a mix of data sets. So if you want to attack a problem to solve it, you've got a huge number of considerations to make about which approach you want, for example, machine learning, which tool sets, and what data set do you need to prove and validate your hypothesis. Which brings us to human skills. All those considerations have to be considered by humans. So you need to hire people and top talent with those new skills and new competencies to evaluate. I'm going to identify this problem to solve. This is the tool set, data set, and approach I'm going to take. That takes people. And your organization needs to develop and build a culture of experimentation where people aren't afraid to test and learn. They aren't afraid to attack problems. They aren't afraid of failure. So people and culture are at the core of this. So what do we value human capital at? Well, in our recent study, it's valued at 1.2 trillion for the global economy. So human beings are worth a fair amount of money. And if we look at that at the country level, we can see the UK, we value human capital at around 27 trillion. We only value physical capital at 6 trillion. So human capital is valued almost four times more than physical capital. In the US, it's almost four times more. In France, almost three times more. So human capital shouldn't be underestimated in order to unlock growth. So when we asked leaders what they saw as the biggest future potential, technology or human capital, you'd expect them to say human capital based on the numbers. Actually, what they said was 60 to 70% replacing their chips on technology. And as we know, technology, AI, it's mainly used to automate processes and take costs out of a business. So that's not going to help them grow their businesses. Remove costs, yes, grow, no. So maybe leaders think the huge opportunity is in automation. So if we, if we look at what risks there are to people in automation, let's look at some roles. On the one side, we have accounting clerks. They're at 96% likelihood of being automated, those jobs, those roles. That'll be left at AI and machines. On the other extreme, we have design engineers. Now, the core in sort of intrinsic motivation for somebody who's an engineer or a designer is problem solving. That's something that humans excel at. So you can see they're only a 3% risk of automation. And everything else is in between. Now, the more process-based your role or job, or the more rules-based your role or job, the more likely it is that software will be developed and will remove that role from the business. So where do people fit in this future based on that? And if I think about my own career, I trained and graduated as a designer. But I didn't foresee 10 years later there'd be such a thing as a user experience designer, because there wasn't the web. I'm that old. I didn't, fore I didn't foresee when I was doing that that 10 years later there'd be a mobile user experience designer, because there were no smartphones, there was no mobile ecosystem. And now we're starting to see roles like AI designer, designing chatbots and interfaces. So the threat of substitution of roles, of automation, taking roles and jobs out of the economy, maybe that's, we're just on the next step of that ongoing continuum, that new jobs will always replace the old jobs. But maybe those new roles and new jobs are more value-adding. They are more targeted at things that we excel at as human beings. 
So if we look at what Sundar Pichai, the Google CEO, thinks, in a couple of years' time, there'll be major skills gaps in those new competencies that we do need around AI, engineering, data analytics. And he says it's a big problem. But I tell you what, if you're a big internet player with a brand that's renowned for innovation, whether it's Baidu and Tencent in China or Amazon and Netflix in the US, it's an even bigger problem if you're a traditional business and you're trying to acquire that top talent. So if you think about what characteristics people need to thrive in this new ecosystem where there is a threat of substitution and automation, it comes back to those unique human skills around design, which is unpicking a problem, considering how to explore the different opportunities and different ways to approach that. Having empathy for customers, which is actively listening to customers, understanding their needs, their motivations, and their circumstances. And curiosity, which is proactively looking for problems to solve with inside the business and outside the business. And analysis. So the perfect left brain, right brain combination, design to analysis. And analysis, which is knowing what queries to put to data to derive the new insights that you can then exploit. Leadership. So having leaders that can lead in a business that's more networked, more connected, where teams are more self-forming, self-managed, where people are more empowered, and innovation is more bottom-up, not just a dictat top-down. Communication and collaboration. So again, cross-disciplinary teams working together, where they all bring different insights and different crafts around a shared problem. And learning agility, which is the ability to continually learn new things and apply them to new problems and new situations. And that's both people at the lowest level of the business and leaders. So learning agility is a key feature of outperforming leaders and companies. Because nothing stays the same. So what can employers do to thrive? Well, there are some new competencies that we will classify as strategic, as core to your business going forward. And one of those would be design. So user experience design, understanding the user experience for people to shop and buy with you or to book with you. Understanding the steps they go through, the motivations they have at each stage. And then engineering. Again, problem solving. Data, AI, and machine learning. These are all strategic competencies that companies are looking at and are fiercely competing for. So they're scarce resources. Now, to attract top talent in these areas, you need to have a really strong value proposition. Just like a chief marketing officer would understand what their value proposition is to attract buyers or shoppers. HR needs to know what is the employer value proposition. Because the relationship nowadays with employees and brands is fairly discretionary. The barriers to leaving and going somewhere else are fairly low. So do you have a clear purpose to attract these types of top talent people? You know, it, you know, what, is, what is the question why? Why do you work for us? Why are you motivated to continue giving your discretionary energy to this business? beyond just working for a wage? Are your leaders going to empower people? Are you going to let people choose the work they do based on people being uh, motivated to go towards jobs and roles or projects and products where they can deploy their skills best or they can grow in the role and develop a sense of mastery? Can you em empower people to do that? And the benefit of doing that is people own the outcomes of their work if they choose what work they do. And challenges. If you want to try to attract designers and engineers, the intrinsic motivation for their roles is problem solving. So how are you going to continually motivate them with new problems? The average tenure in a job in Silicon Valley for tech companies is 18 months. And it's because they can't continually motivate them with new challenges and new problems to solve. So clearly, the future of work relies on unlocking not just physical capital, which is the inputs to business, but human capital to best work out how to leverage the physical capital, how to exploit AI and new, new technology drivers. And the companies that will accrue those benefits are the ones that embrace both. At some point, driving costs out of your business through automation will get diminishing returns. You also need to grow the business, which requires human capital to do so. Thank you very much. College of Knowledge, Tomorrow Conversations. <laughs>